Hey everybody, we're here at Norfolk Naval Base in Norfolk, Virginia, about to go aboard the USS Gerald R. Ford, the Navy's newest nuclear-powered aircraft carrier that just got back from a very historic deployment. We're going to talk to Rear Admiral Doug Verissimo, who is the commander of Naval Air Forces Atlantic, about what happened on this last deployment and what's coming next for Ford. So Admiral Verissimo, it's great to see you again. It's Good been a few you. months. Uh, obviously, it's been a busy time since we last spoke at the Oceana Air Show. So for those who maybe missed the last episode, let's review the high points of your career real quick. I was uh, blessed with being a Blue Angel uh, solo pilot leading to posing. Immediately following that tour, they sent me to be a cat and arresting your officer. Yeah, that's so for all the JOs, who, yeah. the JOs who don't want to do disassociated tours, uh, I do give them sympathy. Uh, but uh, not too much sympathy. But you mentioned that that was a very rewarding the, tour. Those two tours together helped me to decide whether or not this was a profession I wanted to continue to pursue. Uh, both being the rock star and being the blue collar, uh, hard work and getting the job done, support cast, yeoman's work for the air wing, and it has to be done. It doesn't run without the whole team. I was a department head in the uh, Blue Blasters and the ship right, right over my shoulder. Right there Truman, right over, yeah. And uh, I would get to be the CO of the other ship right over our shoulder of uh, the Gunslingers, VFA 105 on the Truman. So GW is a department head and then okay. uh, Truman is CO, XOCO. When we talked at Oceana, you'd had the job of Airland for five weeks. You were pretty new. Uh, and at that time, you I asked a few questions about Ford, the ship we're standing on here on yes, the bridge. Sir. And you mentioned five and a half month cruise, uh, come back for an availability and then go right, right back on cruise. Well, obviously that's not how it worked out. At that time, Ford had been underway for about four months, anticipating that they would get home before Thanksgiving. So let me, let's go back to October 7th. Um, but before we go to the details of how that played out for you as Air Land, can you tell the viewers in sort of the general sense, what is Air Land's role? man train and equip think of it as the back office of a sports team we get the war fighting capability put together with the manning the training and the aircraft and aircraft carrier equipped for the job at hand we hand that over to the certifying authorities carrier strike group four and uh, second fleet here on the east coast and we build that fighting unit up we continue naval uh, sea now continues to maintain and equip that fighting force as they're needed to get ready to deploy once they deploy they chop from different fleet commanders they work for different combatant commanders and sea now continues to man train and equip and make sure they stay in the fight and are ready to go more specifically on october 7th some changes were made uh, above the airline level, but you're in the matrix in terms of uh, the choices that we have, et cetera. So talk to us about how that played out for you and how some of those decisions to extend forward went down. So the entire Mil Navy team that deploys forward with sovereign equipment that uh, is on the high seas, that can be called upon by the president and the sec def to serve where and when they desire. So no other country permissions or other uh, um, diplomatic conversations the president can decide unilaterally. And for me, that's what makes the aircraft carrier and the strike group an indispensable arm of presidential decision space and U.S. resolve. So in this case, the Ford was available in country, not yet coming home, and it was decided to keep her there to maintain stability in the region and show that America was very interested in that part of the world. So how does that play out in terms of the way the word gets to you? Does, you know, as you said, the National Command Authority makes the call, let's just say Secretary of Defense of Austin says, hey, I need that aircraft carrier. And then it goes through CNO to Admiral Caudill at Fleet Forces Check. Command to yep. you. And does Admiral Caudill ask you, hey, Doug, is this good by you? Is there anything I should know about? How does that play out? Well, as a military member in uniform, uh, serving at the pleasure of the president and, and the uh, officers that I, uh, that, uh, I serve, uh, I give my uh, best advice. I have uh, uh, sworn an obligation to the Constitution, and my obligation is to tell them what I think will happen. And so, like any other process, there's some staff work and some communications, and we talk about what the impacts are now and the impacts of the future, and we let the National Command Authority know what those impacts might be. So, insofar as you can say specifically what the impacts were, 
What, what were your concerns about Ford particularly and being extended multiple times? Well, just to reflect back a little bit, very proud of the Ford. Then CNO Gilday, uh, because the Ford did so well in shock trials and those final testing phases, was able to offer the ship as a Ford deployed vessel, not on the map, not in that staff process. So Ford's deployment, their first deployment, was added because she was ready to go. So are we talking about the shorty two plus monther or the the five and a half monther? The five and a half, the, the two okay. monther was a proof of concept. The okay. five monther was on the map, a combat deployment, fully capable uh, certified aircraft carrier. Okay. We get extended the first time where they're going from sent mad to east mad for the presence piece and then subsequent extensions. So ultimately the call was made to get Ford home. Um, what was the driver there? I'll go back to my sports analogy. We've gone double over time. We've gone triple over time. I'm thinking the training staff is getting a little bit nervous for next week's game. What uh, the injury profile is going to be like. So each okay. extension imparts uh, some different risks, additional risks, timing, maintenance. We've got to get that team back in the locker room. We got to get them turned around, whether it's flight deck, non-skid or other uh, items that need to get worked on. And frankly, the people. The people need some time. We want them to continue to serve. Last time we talked, I, I really spoke about the meaning of service for me, and I think the Navy's really, I don't think, I know the Navy's a great place for some young people to get a start. We want to make sure we don't, uh, that we are sincere with that uh, point, that it's a great place to get a start, and we need to uh, instill trust, confidence, and uh, validate their commitment uh, by giving some, them some time to compress. I ask you what's keeping you up at night in September, and you mentioned top of mind was the recruiting piece, but also the retention piece. And as we know from our careers that, you know, you start to get no purse tempo, and, and that's, you know, from aviator standpoint, that's how airline pilots are made. What happens to the chessboard, let's just call it, using a, not a sports analogy, but a, a hobby analogy, because as we're Standing here, as we've pointed out, there's GW, there's HST. This is the most carries we've had in port in a while, right? We have three here. Um, so when one is extended, that affects the turnaround training cycle and the, uh, the schedules of the others, right? In this it, case, did it? It, it? it Not so much the other ships, uh, except in so far that uh, if this ship doesn't get turned around as expected in the future, it can affect other ships in the future. So each ship is under its own schedule, its own maintenance schedule, its own plan, but they are very well thought through and integrated across the force. As extensions come in and we move those chess pieces, it changes the, it changes the steady line of, of availability to the combatant commanders into a little bit of a sine wave. And so those are some of the things we communicate going forward. Uh, you say we have three aircraft carriers here, which is 100% true, but all three of them are operating. All three of them are out of maintenance and they can get across the Atlantic in about nine days if needed. Okay, good And so point. they're all available to the, to the uh, National Command Authority at this Meanwhile, time. Meanwhile, across the river, we have Bush doing a, a maintenance availability. After her long deployment. And then we have Stennis doing an RCOH. And that's a long right. maintenance. That is a midlife, she went 25 years. Yeah. Are those all of your carriers on this coast? You know, uh, Ike underway, these three, those two, is that is that, that correct, complement correct. of aircraft carriers? We get Ford home about three weeks ago, roughly. Um, and as we're looking out at the flight deck, there's all kinds of things going on. We're painting the flight deck. We're doing all kinds of stuff in the hangar bay. Uh, there's containers all over the place. What does my viewership not understand about, let's call it the tooth to tail, of maintaining and and uh, keeping these things seaworthy? What, what does it require? I'll do it in phases. So we have short availabilities, uh, very short, six weeks, where we fix between while the ship is doing its workup cycle, then we have slightly longer availabilities, which the Gerald R. Ford is in right now. Then we have planned incremental availabilities, which are depot work, of which you mentioned the Bush is in a, in a PIA, planned incremental availability time now. There's also docked that are a little bit longer. So right now, Ford's a new ship. Uh, she's been underway for uh, quite some time, but this turnaround is not as uh, long as it might be, uh, and it could be mm, suspended. We could turn the ship around more quickly if we needed. So there's different uh, availabilities that have different con time constraints, both going in and coming out. Uh, but uh, that's what we're managing that 
keeping that line as smooth as possible without getting to the sine wave, if that makes sense, to use more analogies. It, it, it kind of does. So without talking about ships' movements and the other things that are, are not unclassified, what are we doing to Ford? Uh, are there any mods that are the big ticket mods, like getting it capable of of operating F-35Cs, is that in the mix at this during this turnaround? JSFs will be added, on, I believe, on the next availability. Okay. How is email? So I asked you that before, uh, but how did it perform underway in terms of, because the op tempo was, was out there, right? When they got to East Med, they were doing some sortie generation. How did emails perform? Absolutely. emails performed very, very well. The uh, advanced uh, elevators performed very, very well. Uh, the arresting gear performed very well. There is some spiral development to continue to get the most we can squeeze out of that arresting gear. And I'm confident that we're going to continue to increase reliability and cycle times and rates. And that's, uh, that's going to be continued to be, to be worked. You're, you're liking what you're seeing in emails in terms of like steam cat sortie generation. This deck can generate sorties better than the Nimitz better. with fewer people. Okay. When I say we're going to make improvements, we're making improvements to improvements. As we learn on the Ford, we're putting those lessons right into the John F. Kennedy and then the Enterprise to follow. I have a lot of confidence what the Ford class is going to bring as we go forward. And is that a new lens as well? Is that a, ten, a different cell lens uh, well, that we, it's, we used? Well, it's different than what we started with and we used, but it's the same lens that's on all the, all the carriers. So it's it's an improved optical landing system, but it is similar to the other cl other uh, aircraft carriers. What else is Ford going to do in terms of going to sea and proof of concept and there before she goes underway again? There's some remaining testing uh, that uh, because we had the opportunity to get her on that deployment, uh, we deferred and we're going to get through that testing in and amongst and after before this uh, this avail. She'll continue to do support uh, FRS and training CQ on the East Coast, uh, uh, but she's, she's uh, enjoying some well-deserved leave for her sailors and her crew uh, they're taking uh they're you know, half of them take two weeks off and the other half take two weeks off so the crew is definitely enjoying their time back at home we're talking a little bit about you know your ability to cover markers you're the man training and equip guy put the players on the field guy um right now in the med we've gapped carrier presence we have an arg an amphibious ready group where a carrier strike group was and it's going to be that way unless we move Ike back up into 6th Fleet from 5th Fleet. And that doesn't seem likely based on what's going on in the Red Sea. Uh, so what's your comfort level with the demand signal from 6th Fleet? Are they like, hey, I need a carrier. What's going on? Or are they okay with having an amphib there instead? You know, the world has a vote. And we have four active uh, carriers right now on the East Coast that are not in a, in a deep maintenance. We have them available. If the world chooses to vote that the National Camp Mandatory decides that we do some unscheduled, some uh, head of schedule deployments, we are absolutely prepared and ready to do that. That comes with impacts. The National Command Authority has uh, judged that right now the best risk profile is to have that ARGMU uh, in the Eastern Med and Ike available. So they do have two big decks uh, available in uh, that part of the world and they're doing good work for our nation. Whether it's the Marines and the ARGMU on uh, uh, the amphibs or our, our sailors uh, on the carrier strike group, uh, with uh, all of their DDGs, air wing, and the entire team that's working hard out there. So how is Ike doing uh, in terms of the man training equip? Any, any rising uh, uh, needs that were unforeseen based on their incredible op tempo? Nothing out of the ordinary. There's normal attrition and people need to go home and, and tours end and we're able to uh, fill those, but we don't, we're, we're not as filled as much as we'd want to be. I'd love, to, I'd be more comfortable if we had a little bit lar larger bench, but the Ike and their entire team, Crudez and the ship are doing remarkably good work, keeping the sea lines of communication. If you read a business journal right now, they'll talk about the increase in shipping rates and what it costs if we don't have free and open shipping. And the entire strike group is doing our nations and frankly the world's, all of our partners bidding in, in keeping that waterway open. The Ike is doing the purpose of the Blue Water Navy right now. And as we know, that kind of op-tempo action makes deployment go by faster. Right? And, Instead of and, just drilling holes in the sky, shooting winders and, and AMRAM. And their retention is pretty good right now. Uh, it, Sailors find right. we all want purpose. Right. There's purpose here in the Navy. Admiral Doug Verismo, as always, 
Thanks, Ward. You're a Ward. busy man. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Ward.